a series called Uncomfortable, and we're talking about uh, uncomfortable things. <laughs> uh, some of it has been some of it has been uncomfortable. Um, this probably won't be too uncomfortable tonight. It's kind of in the vein of a lot of things that we talk about here, but just some stuff that's been on my heart um, for some time now. And uh, I may be teaching more for my benefit than yours tonight, so just verbalizing and fleshing out some things that are, uh, are on my, my heart, and I hope that it'll be helpful to you. But I, I want to talk to you about um, the balance of grace. The balance of grace. Um, I, I've asked myself the question that why is it the only time you ever hear about balance in church is when it comes to the subject of grace? That's the only time you ever hear people talk about balance. That if, if you're going to preach grace, there's got to be a balance. There's got to be a balance. And people will say things, you know, I, I grew up in church. I'm not, I'm not sure how many days after my mom had me that she went to church for the first time, but it was 1967, so uh, it could have been the next day for all I know. I, I think I was born on a Sunday. I was probably in church by the next Sunday, um, at least. And so all I've ever known, you know, is church. And obviously I grew up in one stream of, of uh, denominationalism in, in one facet. That's all I knew growing up. But as far back as I can remember, like I never heard, any, <laughs> I never heard anybody get up and talk about, now there, there needs to be balance in your prayer life. You know, don't pray too much. There needs to be balance in your fasting life. Don't fast too much. There needs to be balance in church attendance. I heard somebody outside my window say, tonight was the night all the diehards were here. <laughs> so you're the diehards tonight. But, you know, nobody's ever, nobody's ever preached balance in church attendance. Nobody's ever preached. Now, now, be careful. You're going to study your Bible too much. Nobody's ever, nobody's ever said that. But the minute you start teaching people that they have an identity in Christ, the minute you start teaching them that they're forgiven, that they're accepted, that they're loved, that they're covered by the grace of God, that they're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that they're sons and that they're not servants, suddenly um, everybody wants to accuse you of being out of balance and start reminding you that you better remember to preach a balance between that grace stuff and the truth. As if somehow uh, grace is not the truth. And... And if you hear or receive too much grace, your life is all of a sudden going to suddenly be out of balance. If you hear uh, too much grace. I was, I was talking to someone, talking to another pastor, another minister before church tonight. And um, uh, we were just talking about situations in churches and, and people that come to churches and the type of people that we... Uh, have the opportunity to minister to. And when I say the type of people, I shouldn't say that. I should say the people with the types of situations that they have that are coming to our churches. And, and we began to talk about that. And, and uh, my friend told me today, he said, you know, I've just made up my mind that if I'm going to err, I will, I'm going to err on the side of grace. Because I would rather stand before God and say, I loved him too much. Than, than to stand there and say, well, you know, I, I held to my convictions and, and, and all of those kind of things. And so we were talking about that a little bit today, but people somehow believe, you know, that if, if you preach grace too much, that people's lives are going to get out of balance. Well, here is where I think the imbalance is. I think it's an imbalanced gospel to preach about the cross and the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit and have people yawning and bored with those messages because we're teaching and preaching the Word, but we're not giving people an opportunity to experience the Spirit. That's where I think the imbalance is. Because you can, man, listen, you, you can teach the Word 
line upon line, precept upon precept. We could, we could start, and, and I know some of you would like me to do this. It's just not my style. Uh, that, I'm sorry, that's just not the way that I'm wired. But we could, we could take a book in the Bible and go verse by verse by verse and walk you through verse by verse by verse by verse, and you could get a great understanding of the Word. But if you never have an experience with the Spirit, Because, because it's not the Word that makes us alive, it's the Spirit that makes us alive. Come on, somebody. It's, and so, uh, I, I want us to understand, uh, in fact, the Scripture says the, the letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. So I can, you know, I can teach you word, teach you word, teach you word, give you memory verses, make you come back and quote them to me so that we know you did it, checked it off, and at the end of the month give you a star for all the, all the verses that you memorized and did all that kind of stuff. But if you never have an experience to go with what you're learning, to me that's, that's where the imbalance is. Because I'm, I'm you, you, and, and listen, you can go crazy in a lot of areas. Uh, you can have churches that are all word, no spirit. Churches that are all spirit, no word. There's, there's all kind of ways to have imbalance, but I really don't think that preaching the grace of God can qualify as an unbalanced, imbalanced message. So here's what I want to try to tell you, because it's uncomfortable to think about some of this stuff, and that's what we've been talking about, uncomfortability. And, and I want us to understand tonight that for all of the people who think that grace needs some sort of external balancing system, here's what people, I've had people tell me this before. They say, Larry, you need to balance that grace message and preach a little bit of law with it. Well, that's not balance, that's mixture. You need to balance, Larry, you need to balance the grace of God with the demand of God. Balance the grace of God with the justice of God. Which is strange to me because when people say that, it's almost like they can't believe that God can be and is grace and justice at the same time. Just because He's grace doesn't mean He's not justice. Just because he's justice doesn't mean he's not grace. It's like, it's like we think if we preach one, the other becomes of no effect. Am I, am I making sense? And so it, it's almost like if you preach grace, then there's no justice. If you preach justice, there's no grace. But the very idea and the purpose of grace is that when it comes to life inside of you, grace brings with it an inherent sense of justice because grace does not appear to allow you to live a life of no consequence. Grace appears so that you'll begin to understand that in this new covenant that Jesus instituted, for us, watch this, I'm going to say this to you, you need to, you need to write this one down if you, if you haven't already done so, you need to, or if, you, if, you, uh, if you've never heard me say this before, you, you need to get this in your spirit. Here, here's what I need you to understand, the reason why we preach and teach what we do is because you, you've got to understand that when Jesus instituted for us uh, this new covenant, Jesus did not stay here, right? He said, it's necessary for you that I go away. Come on. Because, help me finish this, because he said, if I don't go away, the comforter cannot come. The Holy Spirit can't come. And, and so, and, but when he, the spirit of truth has come, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will lead you and he will guide you into all truth. Now, what does the Old Testament say about the law? What was the law in the Old Testament? The law was a schoolmaster, a teacher. Right? The law was there to teach us because before the law, we didn't know what sin was. But when the law came, it described sin for us. It, it taught us what sin was. So here's the thing about the new covenant. The thing about the new covenant is this, that the Holy Spirit in the new co is to the new covenant what the law was to the old covenant. In the old covenant, it was the law that taught, but the law couldn't deliver. Somebody, I know there's just a few of us. The, the, the law could teach and the law could point out sin, but the law could not deliver from sin. Here's the difference. In the new covenant, the Holy Spirit can, can point out error in your life, but the Holy Spirit also has the power to bring life to you. 
And, and so that's the difference, and that's why, that's why we can't mix it up, and we can't, uh, that, that's why people that talk about this balance, where you need to, man, you need to remind people of how angry God can be. Don't just tell them how loving He can be. Tell them how, no, all of that was satisfied, and now I'm living in a new thing. I'm living under a new covenant, and in this new covenant, I have the Holy Spirit. That's why we're, we believe that, we believe and teach here we're a Spirit-filled group of people. We believe in teaching about the infilling of the Spirit, preaching about the the infilling of the Spirit. Why? Because you, you need something to direct and to guide your life. Because if left to yourself, you're not going to be able to do it. That's what the law was. The law proved that you couldn't do it by yourself. But how do I now do it? I do it by the power of the Holy Spirit living in me. So now then, I don't need an external law. I have an internal compass through the power of the Spirit that leads and guides me into life everlasting. Hope I'm making sense. So, so watch this, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, says this. I think it's in the message. Here's the Old Testament prophecy about what I'm talking about. Old Testament, this is prophetic, look into the future. The Lord speaks through Ezekiel and he says, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone heart from your body. And would place it, watch, this is, this is where it's at. I'll replace it with a heart that is God-willed, not self-willed. This is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. To take your old self-willed heart and replace it with a God-willed heart. I'll put my spirit in you. Notice that, capital S there. Holy Spirit, I'll put my spirit in you and I will make it possible for you to do what I tell you and for you to live by my commands. And that word, it said, you'll once again live in the land I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people and I'll be your God. But if you go back to that the previous verse, when he says you'll be able to do my commands, that word commands there is not the old law. So I'm not. So the Holy Spirit and grace didn't come just to give you the power to do what you couldn't do under the old law. Jesus came and fulfilled. Come on, somebody. He came and fulfilled the law. Am I am I still in the Bible? He came and fulfilled the law. When he fulfilled the law, it, it's speaking in contractual language. Because it was called the Old Covenant, right? Covenants are contract. It, there's contractual language involved there, legal language involved there. And Jesus fulfilled the Old Covenant. And, and if, you, if you trace the language back to fulfill there, it's... Okay... So, um, Wayne has some four by fours, right? You got some some uh, doohickey machines that people get killed on and stuff. Uh, what are they? What are they? Four wheelers? Yeah, that's what they are. Um, he's got he's got a four wheeler. Um, he's got a couple of them. Whatever. What's the most expensive one you got? How, how much did how much it cost? Who? Okay, so so he's got one that. Might have cost eight thousand dollars. He's going to sell it to me. Let's just—he's going to sell it to me for six. All right. He's going to sell it to me for six thousand. I agree to pay him a hundred dollars a week for sixty weeks. We with me? All right. So, so watch this. After sixty weeks, has the contract been fulfilled? So I would be stupid to continue to pay him a hundred dollars a week, right? It'd be good for him, right? Stupid for me. Why? Because it has been fulfilled. The contract has been fulfilled. It has been taken care of in full. So when Christ came and fulfilled the old law, He took care of it in full, and you're crazy to keep trying to pay on something that He has already contractually taken care of. There's nothing left on it. And so he said, so now then under this new thing though, 
I fulfilled that. I'm instituting this new thing. And I'm going to take out of you this heart of stone. I'm going to put in you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put in you, I'm going to take out the self-willed heart where you did things the way you wanted to do them. I'm going to replace it with a God-willed heart. How does that happen? And it can only happen by the Spirit. The only way I get a God-willed heart is if the Holy Spirit lives in me. Come on. The only way that, and he said, so when he says, and you'll be able to do my commands, he was not talking about the Old Testament law. He was talking about now under this new covenant, when you have a God-willed heart put in you, when I speak to you, when my spirit speaks to you, it'll speak to that God-willed heart. And whatever my spirit says to that God-willed heart, you will be able to perform. How? By the grace of God that's living in you. Am I making any sense? So watch this, grace, grace teaches me that heavenly character can only be produced in my life through a heavenly agent. I can't produce heavenly character in my life. That's why Jesus had to come. That's why, what, that's why the law was of no benefit, because it just didn't work. It didn't produce life. In fact, it produced death. The law produced... Think about this. Why did they have to slay bulls and goats? Because the law demanded death. The Spirit brings life. The law demanded the Spirit produces. Anybody see anything different here? But how does all of that... So, so how do I get all of that? You, the only way you get it is by grace. You couldn't earn it. You don't deserve it. You can't. Still with me? So watch what Paul said here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to show you something because now I'm going to blow your mind. Because I'll, I got you on the grace train and now that I'm fixing to make you mad. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the... I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. You still here? So let me read that to you in the Passion Translation. I think it breaks it down a little better. Watch this. So Paul says, yes, I'm the most significant of all the, the apostles. Unworthy, even to be called an apostle, because I hunted down believers and persecuted God's church. But God's amazing grace has made me who I am. And His grace to me was not fruitless. In fact, I worked harder than all the rest, yet not in my own strength, but God's. For His empowering grace is poured out upon me. Paul said this. Here's where I'm going to mess you up. Paul said, whatever I am before you now, it's by the grace of God. And watch. He said, that grace was not uh, New King James or whatever that was up there. said, the grace of God was not in vain. The Passion Translation said, his grace was not fruitless. He went on to say, I worked harder than anybody else. So watch this. Watch. So the implication from Paul is this. That grace that does not result in effort is a fruitless, vain grace. I don't work to get grace. But when grace comes to my life, I worked harder than everybody. Because I refused to allow the grace of God that was poured over me to be a fruitless grace in vain. Am I making any sense right now? So here's the uncomfortable rub about the balance of grace. People, people want you to preach grace, but if you ever say the word W-O-R-K-S, people freak out. Because... Well, Larry's trying to put us back under the law. Works is not a dirty word. Hey. 
Hey, Dale, tell them we'll call them back. <laughs> or let us know if it's coming at us. One of the two, man. One, let us know. <laughs> so, so are you with me? Is everybody with me? Grace that does not produce effort in your life is fruitless grace. And so people who say, and here's my problem, here, because this has been my struggle. I believe, I think you know by now, man, I want to preach this grace message because I believe it's the good news of the gospel, of the grace of Jesus Christ. And our church, I've had other pastors, and I don't know this to be true, I'm just telling you perspective from other pastors. I, I've had several other pastors in our area tell me, Larry, you're yours one of the only churches, one of the only churches in our area that's seeing any kind of growth or movement right now. Well, it's not because I'm, I'm a great pastor. It's not because we have great facilities. It's not because we have the greatest programs. I believe people are hungry for good news. In fact, I believe people are starving for good news. And so I, I, I want to preach, preach a good news gospel. I want to preach a, a good news message. But here's what I don't understand. When people come and hear the good news, why is it when you hear the good news of grace, all of a sudden you want to quit everything? You want to quit coming to church because I got grace. You want to quit giving because I got grace. You want to quit trying to live uh, a, a, a life that's pleasing to God because it doesn't matter. I got grace. Uh, this is too heavy for this little group here tonight, isn't it? I'm... Which part? Grace that does not grace that does not produce fruit. Grace that does not produce effort is fruitless and vain. Grace that doesn't produce effort is fruitless and vain. Paul said, I worked more than everybody else. So, so here's what grace does. Here's what grace does. Grace introduces us to a life of liberty. It introduces us to identity. Grace gives us the right to call ourselves the sons and the daughters of God. You still here? Grace does all these things in our life. It gives us the ability to do all these things that, that, that we couldn't have done by ourselves. Grace brings that uh, in, into fruition in our life. It, it gives us uh, the right to eat at His table. It gives us the right to uh, share in, in the goodness of God. It gives us the right to share in His joy. It gives us the right to, to have a changed identity. It gives us the right to be free from the law. Grace gives us all these rights. Grace gives us the right to say, I've been forgiven. All of that stuff comes out of new covenant grace. But from that grace also comes a responsibility to be children of God in a culture that does not acknowledge God. Righteous, here, here, here's, here's what it does for me. When, when I begin to understand, here, here's what I know to be true. Here's what I know to be fact. When I begin to understand what grace really does in my life, grace brings all these rights into my life. Yes, I, I have all these rights because I'm now a child of the King. But grace also brings a responsibility to me to be righteous in an unrighteous generation. A responsibility to be hope dealers and kingdom advancers in a culture that knows very little about living in and under the authority of the king's domain. I have a responsibility to show love. I have a responsibility to show forgiveness. I have a responsibility to take care of people who I don't think deserve to be taken care of. And a responsibility to stand out in the crowd and not go along with the crowd. Grace doesn't give me the, the, the right to just live any old way. With my rights come responsibility to be who he has empowered me now to be so I don't run from works I run because I can now run and do good works mm. see this is this is the uncomfortable truth Here, here's what I I have to understand and what I have to know is that the uncomfortable truth is I haven't received grace to take away all my problems, right? I, I haven't, grace didn't come so that, so that I would no longer have any problem. Grace didn't come just to relieve me of all of my pressures. You've received grace 
so that you could face your troubles, face your chaos, and show the world that through the power of grace, not through the power of the law, not through moralism, not through any other method, but through grace, it's possible to face your chaos, to face your trials, to face the pressure, to face the problem, and then come through it better and closer to your purpose than you were before the chaos ever started in your life. The uncomfortable truth about the gospel is God may not cause your storm, but God will use your storm. And the reason that I know this is because Jesus told his disciples to get in the boat and let's go to the other side. Y'all remember that story? Now watch this. Great night to talk about this because Jesus told his disciples, get in the boat, let's go to the other side. So Jesus was either terrible at meteorology Or the other option is he knew the storm was coming, but he also knew that empowering grace was going to get on board that boat. And when the disciples came through the storm, they would have an understanding of his power and grace that they never would have gotten if the journey had been pleasant and problem-free. If we could ever learn the truth, and here's, here's why I believe grace is so important for us. In our lives. This is why I preach grace right here. Because you need to learn the truth. That you will never ever. Have a trouble free. Storm free life. Amen. Not ever. In fact John 16 33. Jesus said this. I've told you all of this. So that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials. And sorrows. But take heart. Because I have overcome the world. So Jesus didn't lie to us. He said, new covenant or not, in this world, on this earth, even those of you affected by grace are going to have troubles, trials, and sorrows. And not just a few Many. See, we weren't ever meant to be trouble free. We were never meant to be problem free. But you and I were left. We were left in an unbelieving world to demonstrate to that world what it looks like when instead of begging to escape all my issues, I get this right here. This is what I want you to get. Instead, instead of begging to escape all my issues, in the middle of my issue, I invite heaven into my hell. And I live out for everyone to see thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right here in the middle of my personal hell, let your will be done. See, God, take me out, take me out, let me escape, let me escape. And God is saying, no, I want to leave you there, not because I don't love you, but I want the world to be able to see that there's an empowering grace that in the middle of storms, in the middle of trial, in the middle of trouble, you don't ever have to worry about being alone or being powerless because I am with you and if you show the world that you can bring heaven into your hell people's lives will be forever changed Amen. so when I invite his presence into my storm rather than trying to fix my storm rather than trying to redirect my storm rather than trying to escape my storm I come through the storm better than when I went in and the way I made it through was from faith to faith, through grace upon grace. <laughs> I don't, uh, somebody got a Bible? Nobody brings a Bible to this church anymore. Stephan, you got a Bible? Let me, can I borrow that for just a second? I can't see it, but. <laughs> Seriously, dude? <laughs> He got the smallest. That dude's got good eyes right there, man. So what? Let me go get my. So watch this. Watch, 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 watch. What is this? What is this? It makes sense that a guy from England would have the English Standard Version. So watch this. Let me get over here. 
And the, John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory as the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He comes after me. He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now watch this, verse 16. For from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. I don't think you really capture yet. We have received grace upon grace. How? Come on. From his fullness. From his fullness, we have received grace upon grace. So when I come to Jesus, Jesus is the pinnacle and the climax. There is nothing beyond Jesus in a spiritual experience. And when I receive Jesus, I receive grace upon grace. (laughs) So how can grace be out of balance when I just keep receiving it because it's who he is? Am I making sense? He said I, you receive through his fullness because he's full of grace. It's just who he is. I receive from his fullness completeness, grace upon grace upon grace. So as I move from trial and trouble, as I move from pressure, thank you, my friend, as I move from pressure to pressure in my life, I move because of the grace of God. And every trial that I come through, every trouble that I advance through, every test that I pass is another testimony to the power of the grace of God. Anybody still here? So watch this. I'm kind of. I know I'm kind of all over the place. Just stay with me. Almost there. We always want to shake a fist at God and say that a loving God wouldn't have allowed me to go through this storm. And a loving God says no. But that's why I got on the boat with you, so you wouldn't have to go through it by yourself. Because you don't have the capacity to make it through this by yourself and in your own strength. But grace climbed into your hole and said, come on, let's go to the other side. Oh, man, come on. Come on, somebody. We always want to say, God left me. He, why did he cause this storm? He didn't cause it, but he'll use it, and he'll get on board with you and go right through. And if he says we're going to the other side, you can count on it. We're going to the other side. Grace got on the ship with you. So my rights as a son of God are real through the power of His grace. But so are my responsibilities. Amen? My rights are real. Everything that I've talked about that you have a right to. Forgiveness. Man, today... um, I did a couple of jail visits today, and, and I sat with a guy today for a, a little bit, had a great conversation. But as I sat with this young man, uh, try to be gentle here, but as I sat with this young man, um, it's a young man that went to TYC, Texas Youth Commission, when he was 15 years old. When he was 16 years old, He was put in general population at the bird unit at 16 years old. He went in at 16 years old with full-grown men. And he spent the next 18 and a half years confined. At 33 years old, he was finally... Paroled on a 20-year sentence. He'd done 18 and a half years on a 20-year sentence. Then I talked to some other guys today. who I, Things have changed so much that guys that are facing 20 years now, they only, they'll only do 12% of their sentence. <laughs> so on a 20-year, they'll do less than two years. 
because the prisons are overcrowded and we're trying to... But this young man did 18 and a half years of a 20-year sentence. And he got locked away when he was 15. And at 33, he was put back out on the streets and told, go get a job, stay out of trouble. How do you do that when the entire world has changed from the time you went in to the time you got out and you went in without any skills and you went in without any uh, education? And this young man began to talk to me today and I sat on the other side of the window. Y'all can be mad at me about this if you want to. But I sat on the other side of the glass from him today and as he began to talk to me, I just stopped him. And I called him by name and I said, listen. I said, everything that you're telling me, because he had a mother and dad who were involved in drugs. His mother turned him over to the authorities when he was 14 because she wanted him out of her house rather than to have to deal with him. His mother, dad, grandmother all died while he was in prison. He has... Two brothers that he has nothing to do with. That's the only family he knows anything about. Everything about his life has been stripped and taken away. And while he was in prison, he got involved in gangs and all these other kind of things. And I just stopped him and I said, listen to me, man. Here's the deal. All the stuff you're telling me is rooted in identity. You didn't have a dad who gave you any identity. Y'all can look at me crazy tonight, but I'm telling the truth. You didn't have a dad who gave you identity. So you started trying to search for your identity. You started trying to find a place to fit in. So you started hanging with crowds that would accept you, and the crowds that would accept you were crowds that were running into trouble. And before long, you were caught up in trouble, and then you're put away. You go to prison. You're trying to survive, and you're still trying to find identity, so you get involved in gangs in prison. Everything you've done in your life up to this point, has been a cry for please tell me who I am. <laughs> and I said, and then what happens is a system basically throws you away. And so I looked at him today and through glass, and by now tears are streaming down my face because I'm a big old baby and I'm looking at him and I'm crying and he's crying. And I said, I want to tell you something. I said, I'm asking you to forgive us. Forgive us for believing that a 15-year-old had no future and had no value. Forgive us for not speaking into your life. Forgive us for not being there. Come on, somebody. Because we can talk about God. We can talk about our rights, but we have a responsibility to people. Come on, somebody. We have a responsibility to people, and we have a responsibility to, to difficult people. And we have a responsibility to people that don't dot all the I's and cross all the T's the way that we think they ought to do them. I wish somebody was helping me right now. And so you, you can brag. We can brag. Listen, guys. That's why this church is messy. Because as my friend told me today, and I, I don't even mind telling you who it was, I was talking to Jay Pike, and as Jay told me today, he said, Larry, when we stand before God, I'd rather stand there and tell him I loved people. And, 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 and God, if that puts me on the wrong side of you... <laughs> I would rather be on that wrong side of you because I know you're full of grace and love. And I would rather have loved people than turned people away. I would rather have been welcoming. I would rather have been loving. I would rather, I would rather have been accepted. Because listen, we, I, can, I can brag about, man, I got favor. I got favor. I got favor. God's favored me. I'm favored by the king. I'm a, I'm a child of the king. But what are you doing in, in, in turn? What, what is your responsibility to the people that you're living around? There's young men just like I've met with today who need a group of people who will stand up and say it's not just about our rights, but it's about our responsibility to reach in the pit and help pull you up because you have value to God you have value to God so 
Luke chapter 12, verse 47 says this. New Living Translation says, And a servant, watch this, and a servant who knows what the master wants, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions, will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Now I'm going to blow... <laughs> yeah, I don't want that verse. Hallelujah. We're burning people already. And Jesus is saying that he had... When he said, I come to set the world on fire, what he's talking about was... I, he, man, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to cause division. I mean, if you really preach Jesus, he will cause division. Whoa! Hallelujah! Stay up with me back there. There's a step back there. If Everybody good back there in the back? For all of you watching, it wasn't an earthquake or a tornado. We just slipped off the step. So here's... Where was I? It's dangerous to be looking... What? Division. Thank you. See, somebody's paying attention. Thank you. So if you really preach Jesus, Jesus will cause division. And mostly he'll cause division among religious people. Because when you really preach the Jesus who came in fullness, grace upon grace, it'll cause people to be divided. But this story right here, Jesus, these are red letters. Jesus is telling this story. And he says, to the person that's been given much, much is going to be required. And he said, a servant who knows what his master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out that, man, that's not a good thing, right? But watch this. That story, I'm going to mess some of your theology up, but that story has nothing to do about earning salvation. That story is a story about responsibility of those who have obtained so great a salvation. It's not a story about earning and it's a story about responsibility. And um, we're in a stewardship campaign at this church. And people always believe that anytime you talk, start talking about stewardship, you're automatically and only speaking about money. And really what that does is that gives away the posture of people's hearts because they start getting all offended about it. But stewardship is about everything you are and everything you have. And coming to the realization and understanding that hoarding what you are and being stingy with who you are is being irresponsible. Because whatever you have and whatever you are, you're always going to encounter somebody in this life who can be bettered by what you are. And if you refuse to give it to them, that is irresponsibility at the core. Today as I sit there, I don't try not to go... As I sat there today, can I be honest with you? Can I just be honest? I had two jail visits today. My day started off with a bang, man, but it's, it's been a wild day today. My daughter told me today, she said, Dad, I don't know how you do what you do. <laughs> it's just been one of those stupid days. Everybody's mad, everybody's upset, nobody's happy, and Jesus is to blame. Hallelujah. And it all started before I ever even got out of the house today. 7.30 this morning, man, phone ringing. And, I'm, and so I'm in the middle of getting dressed. I'm trying to get out of the house because I know it's Wednesday and I'm trying to get my stuff together. And Wednesdays I like to spend alone, but I got a lot of stuff I need to do today. And, and uh, I have to be honest with you, man. I'm just, I know some of y'all don't like this when I'm, when I'm vulnerable. But, but I really didn't want to go to the jail today. I didn't. I didn't want to go. And, and I'm going to tell you, I, I even had another thought today. I knew one of the people I was going to see didn't know the other one's first time I'd be meeting. This one. And, and I had this other thought today. Man, same old people. I know y'all don't ever think I think like that. Same old people, same old stuff. 
Is this too real tonight? Man, there's not anything new I can tell this cat today. And I'm really kind of irked in my spirit because I don't really want to go. And I get there, and when I got into both of those sessions today, I couldn't sit there and look across the table and not be moved. Because I realized to whom much is given, much is required. And I can't come in here today and say, hey, I'll be praying for you five minutes and I'm out. Spent over an hour with each one of those guys today. I mean, I could have been doing a lot of things with those two hours for Larry. But I realized when I walked out, man, I walked out to my car and got wet because it was raining and I walked out. But I'm telling you, I walked out in a better frame of mind than I walked in because I realized that there were two men that I met today that didn't have necessarily all that I have, but I had some. I, 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 told, I told both of them, I said, I said I'm, I'm not going to be able to, to solve your issues. In fact, I really can't solve your issues today. And, but, but it's stingy for me not to offer you what I am and what I have so that you can be better. And if I abdicate my responsibility on this earth as a new covenant believer, then I'm not being a good steward of what God has given to me. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 3 and verse number 1, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in 3 o'clock prayer. And as they approached the temple, a man lame for birth was carried in each day, and he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful, so he could beg and the people going from the people going in the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And Peter and John looked at him and intently, and they said, Look at us. And the lame man looked at them, eagerly expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. So listen, I may not have what you're asking me for but I've got something that I can put into your life that you will be better when I when I leave than when I came here and you have the same thing and for you not to give away what you have been given is abdicating your responsibility to the grace of God that's been put in your life I hope I'm making sense oh yes oh yes I'm a child of the king. Well, good for you. What are you doing with those rights? What are you doing as a king's kid? When's the last time you took responsibility for dropping a little heaven into somebody else's hell? Well, Larry, that's what, we, that's what you're supposed to do. No, 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 no. That's what each one of you are supposed to do. You've received the same grace that I have received. When's the last time you dropped a little heaven into somebody's personal hell? You brought grace into a moment. You didn't just claim your right. You took your responsibility and said, Hey, it looks like you're having a bad day. Let me share with you what God has done for me. Hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Hey, can I buy you lunch? Hey, can I just sit with you and, and just be with you for a few minutes? Because how many of you know there's power and presence I may not have a lot of stuff to give you but whatever I am I can give to you in this moment because it's my responsibility because grace is it's uncomfortable to talk about responsibility because Larry don't put us back under works that's not what it's about it's responsibility so for all those sincere people out there who think that I don't believe in works well you're sincerely wrong Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I never said I didn't believe in works. I just don't believe in earning. But there's good works that we can do, and it's our responsibility because grace has been given. I'm, I'm trying to close, but Paul opens... Almost every one of his epistles, his letters to the churches, by teaching and by reinforcing to them their spiritual identity. I, didn't, I don't have time to like... But you can go and see what I'm talking about if you're really interested. Almost Corinthians and Ephesians and Galatians. and All, all of these epistles that he wrote to the church... Paul doesn't come preaching at them, stop doing, stop doing, stop doing, stop doing, stop doing, stop doing. doing. You're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. Stop doing, stop doing. 
Burn, baby, burn. That's not what he. That's not what he does. Paul comes to them in almost every epistle, and the first thing he does is start establishing who they are. He preaches identity to them. He tells them who they are in Christ and what belongs to them as children of the King. But in almost every same epistle, while he starts by laying the foundation of who they are with identity, Paul, almost to the letter, closes every single one of his epistles by telling them, so now that you know who you are, here is what you should be doing. Because of who you are, now consider this. Start doing this. Become this. Because you know now who you are. And behavior follows belief. And what I believe flows out of who I know that I am. You still here? He lays the base of identity because he wants us to understand that works don't equal righteousness. But if I've been made righteous, then my life should be bearing fruit that testifies of the transformation that has taken place in my life. This, I'm closing with it. I'm going to leave you with this and just let you chew on this a little bit. And watch, we're not going to have any grand finale or anything. I'm just going to drop this bomb. And the first one to your car is a rotten egg. I don't know, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but here, here's, here's what I've noticed and here's what I've seen. So right, right, before, right before Jesus goes to the cross, not long before Jesus goes to the cross, he's walking down a road one day to Jerusalem and he passes a fig tree that has no figs on it. And Jesus curses the fig tree. And then he goes from there to the temple. And Caleb, he gets to the temple. And this, is, this is powerful too. But the Jews, because people had to, let me, I gotta explain. People had to come to the temple to offer sacrifice. But many times they have to travel long distance. So it was not feasible for them to bring their sacrifice from a long way off. So vendors had set up at the temple to sell the sacrifices that they needed. But watch this, watch, watch, watch. But the place that they had set up their tables was in the court of the Gentiles. They set their tables up in the court of the Gentiles, thereby making sure that no Gentiles were able to get in because they had taken all the space to sell their wares. And Jesus walks to the temple. I hope this gives you a deeper meaning. He walks to the temple, turns over the tables. Yeah. And drives them out of the temple and said, my house was meant to be a house of prayer with open doors for everyone to be able to get in. But you have made it a den of thieves because you've set up to where they can't even get in. And he drives them. Are you all with me? And he drives them out. And then he tells the Jews, he said, I'm telling you the truth. This temple is going to be destroyed. And the temple was a symbol of an old covenant. <laughs> I got, and I got news for you. For all of you guys that are waiting for them to build a third temple in Jerusalem so that Jesus could come back, you're way off base because the, other, the third temple has already been built because you are the temple of the holy. You are the new covenant temple. Don't let me get into that. People be leaving this church in droves. Hallelujah. It ain't going to happen. That ain't happening. Okay. So hallelujah. So, so Jesus says, you destroy this. Or, or he said, I'm telling you, this temple is going to be destroyed. He tells them, you destroy this temple, but in three days I'm going to raise this up. They didn't understand. What he was talking about was the old is going to be done away with. There's going to be a new 
that's going to come to order. Oh, somebody help me right here. And when the new comes to order, everybody is going to be welcome in Jesus Christ and there will be nobody that can't get in. What he was trying to tell them is, I'm about to raise a new kingdom. You guys, you Jews that don't want to recognize me, you can have this one. place in the scripture it talks about the elements are going to burn with a fervent heat D- did you know that the elements there if you trace the word elements there it goes all the way back to the tablets of stone the old law is what it really means and the tablets of stone were put in the old temple <laughs> and in AD 70 the old temple was burned to the ground the elements the old commands melted with a fervent heat Jesus was trying to tell them, y'all are looking for me to raise an army. I'm not raising an army. Y'all can have this. I'm checking out. I'm raising a new kingdom. And in my kingdom, anything that doesn't produce life can't be a part. That's why he cursed the fig tree. Because a tree that doesn't produce fruit can't be part of the king's domain. That's why he cursed the temple because a temple that doesn't have open doors can't be part of the new covenant kingdom. Am I making any sense here today? Because if you, and and so here's the deal. What Jesus was trying to teach his disciples in those two moments was if you're a fig tree, you have a responsibility to produce figs. If you're a temple, you're supposed to have open doors. And if you're a child of the king, you're supposed to be advancing the kingdom in the earth. So just because all things are lawful and you can do what you want doesn't mean you should because all things do not benefit or advance my kingdom. You have responsibility. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says that she's understanding it, I think. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. But you must be careful. We could easily interchange that word so that your rights do not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. Got to be careful. So that your freedom, Larry, I'm free, man. I got grace. I'm free. I can do anything I want. I can live how I want. Be careful. You have a responsibility that your freedom doesn't cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. And last verse, Galatians 5.13. For you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, Use your freedom to serve one another in love. Listen how it reads in the Passion Translation. Beloved ones, God has called us to live a life of freedom in the Holy Spirit. But don't view this wonderful freedom as an opportunity to set up a base of operations in the natural realm. Freedom means that we become, I love this, freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another, expressing love in all that we do. The uncomfortable thing is, grace is powerful. But with grace comes responsibility. You can do drugs if you want to. You can. You're a big boy, you're a big girl. But how's it affecting people around you? You can drink if you want to. But how is it affecting responsibility around you? You can be mean, sarcastic, nasty. You can treat your spouse horribly. You can do all that. You're big enough to do it. But you have a responsibility. You can be unkind to your children. Come on, somebody. But you have a responsibility to express your freedom in love and serve one another. I hope I've made sense here tonight. There is a balance to grace, and it's called responsibility. So I deputize all of you to drive home responsibly. Enjoy the grace of God. Bask in your favor. 
but get up and be responsible because to whom much has been given, much is required. Father, I bless every person that's in this room tonight. I speak life over them. Lord, help us to understand that if we're a fig tree, there's supposed to be figs on us. We're supposed to have fruit. And if I stay attached to you, you're the, the vine, I'm the branch. If I abide in you, fruit is going to be part of my life. Help me to maintain my focus so that I understand that yes, I do have freedom. Yes, I do have identity. Yes, I do have forgiveness. Yes, I do have joy, peace. I'm not under constraint to do anything, but I am responsible to act and behave and live out my life in direct measure to what you have poured into my life by the power of grace. Help us to accept our responsibility and to serve our world and to bring a little bit of heaven into somebody's hell. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you tonight. Seriously, be safe on your way home. We love you. I wouldn't hang around too long. It's going to get nasty, or it is nasty. Be safe. The Lord bless you. Oh, if you have.